Welcome back to the Confidence Through Health podcast. This is episode 145, where I speak with Dr. Bill Rolls, who is the founder of Vital Plan. He is also the author of The Cellular Wellness Solution. And we talk about cellular health. And this is one of my passions is helping people become healthy at the cellular level. And one of the things he found through his own health issues, which he talks about, and we go into detail about, he learned the importance of herbs and he learned that traditional medicine was not necessarily what was going to make him healthy at the cellular level, that it was there for an acute purpose. And we talk about the difference between the acute purposes for, for medicine and then the chronic disease issue. We spent a lot of time talking about chronic diseases and how your gut microbiome plays a factor in that and the microbes that are in your gut play a factor in that and how they get into the rest of your body. Um, really, it, it, it taught me a lot about how herbs interact in that aspect and how microbes interact with every cell in your body. Um, some fascinating things. We talked a little bit about Parkinson's in in relation to uh, it's just an example of a disease and how the 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 gut plays a factor, how the herbs play a factor, how the microbes play a factor, how all of those things. And if you're just looking to treat the symptoms, you're missing the bigger picture and you're missing what's really going to make you healthy at the cellular level. And that is what's going to prevent you from having chronic diseases and from having uh things develop later in life or even earlier in life, you know, like cancers, heart disease, um, Parkinson's, other diseases like that. Um, and so we talk about these microbes. We talk about how they interact. We talk about the herbs and the importance for supplementing, uh, which may not be the right word, but including, including supplementing is not the right word. Including is the right word, including those herbs in your diet, in your meal plan, in your food so that as you're nu- providing nutrients to these cells, these herbs are helping promote healthy cells and a healthy body from the inside out. Uh, and that is the only way really that you can avoid uh, chronic diseases is the prevention piece of it. And herbs are a big piece of that. And so I think you're going to enjoy this. I was, I was fascinated. I could have talked with him for hours, um, but unfortunately we had to, we had to, we had to mind his time. Um, but it's a great conversation. So, uh, Dr. Bill Rawls, again, he's the author of The Cellular Wellness Solution. Well, thank you, Dr. Rawls, for being a guest on the Confidence Through Health podcast. Oh, my pleasure. Absolutely. So, first off, like to to let our listeners know a little bit about who you are and, and, you know, and I love talking to um, physicians who have had sort of that, that their own experience that have brought them to like, oh, there's some changes from traditional medicine that we need to be looking at. Um, yeah. And your story is a is a is, I don't want to say extreme, but it's a bit one that's like, I think people maybe don't don't realize how damaging some of the things that they come in contact with can be, uh, but how yes. they can be healed from a from a natural standpoint. Yes, um, yeah, I, I, you know, I I went into this from a wellness point of view. You know, mm-hmm. I I went into medicine to make people well. And in medical school, I saw that wasn't what a lot of it was about. So I ended up going to, into obstetrics and gynecology because it was dealing with a well population in general. Right. And the interventions were generally acute and people got well from that. And, you know, delivering a baby was just really cool. Yeah. <laughs> the, the downside of that 30 years ago is that it was just really stressful. You know, there was night call. I took call every second to third night um yeah. this was in in the early 90s and through the 90s and there was this debate about whether we really needed sleep at that time and i bought right. into that you know and it's like yeah i can just push through this thing you know i i got two hours of sleep last night tonight i'm not on call but yeah there's stuff i need to do and you end up until it's staying up till 12 or one o'clock and then get up at 6 30 or 7 the next day and do it all again right and i just kept pushing and You know, and it was that balance of community and family and doing my job well and all of these things. And what got shorted was my own health. So by the time I was in my late 40s, my health just deteriorated totally. And it wasn't like I developed one thing and then another. 
everything fell apart all at once. My heart, my brain, my joints, I mean, my gut, especially yeah. everything. Um, I developed a tremor and it was like, ah, am I getting Parkinson's? And, you know, I had all these weird paresthesias and like, oh, it could be MS. And, but the tests weren't really showing anything. And I finally identified with fibromyalgia just because that's about all there was. Right. And like so many people with fibromyalgia, you know, after years of getting nowhere, it was like, maybe I've got Lyme disease. And if I can, you know, if I can get a test positive for that Lyme disease microbe, I can be cured. I can be well again. Mm -hmm. So I worked hard and, you know, I'd been bitten by ticks for my whole sure. life. Yeah. I mean, I played in the woods and when I was a kid and I, you know, so I finally found that it's like, yes, you know, and I did the antibiotics and Several rounds of antibiotics made me worse instead of better. And I had all these ongoing issues. I had to stop doing obstetrics and I was really getting frustrated. Um, but, you know, there was just this part of me. I mean, you, you know, you talked about your journey being led. Mm -hmm. I felt like I was being led in a direction, you know, and, and when I made that transition from why is all this happening to me to, okay, what am I supposed to be learning here? And let's start paying attention because if I can figure this out for me, I can use it to help other people too. Right. And that was really the transition point. And things started falling into place. You know, I, I happened to read a book um, about using herbs for chronic Lyme disease. And that came out right about the time I was going through this struggle. I mean, it was yeah. like, it was written for me. Right. Um, and I embrace that actually with very little confidence that it was going to help, but it was kind of like, you know, I'm not going to chase around, travel all over the country and spend tons of money. I'm going to figure this thing out. Um, the herbs made sense, but, you know, we were had that trained bias against natural therapies right. and herbal therapies. And so when much of my exposure was, you know, patients using herbs, they were using inexpensive products and they didn't get much out of them. But I was using high grade extracts, herbs that you wouldn't find in your basic health food store. Right. But I admit, did my research, I found that these things were safe for me to use. And I started getting my health back. And of course, it wasn't overnight, you know, and oh, yeah. at first at that point, I thought, okay, I'm killing the microbes finally. And it's taken me, it took me years to find out that wasn't what was happening. Oh, I really? was normalizing my system. You know, I was suppressing microbes, not just the Lyme microbes. I was suppressing this explosion of everything that was in my system yeah. and restoring cellular health. And that's what the herbs do. You know, they, right. they promote healing, they, they restore cellular health. But it takes time. You know, my total recovery took about five years. Right. But that's been a decade ago. And for the past decade, I have had above average health. You know, I'm 65 now. I'm kite surfing and doing things that people my age generally don't get to do. Right. And more than just get over the symptoms of Lyme disease, you know, I had essential hypertension when I was in my 30s and all these gut issues and, you know, cholesterol and all that normalized. And yeah, I changed my diet, my lifestyle, all of those things. But taking the herbs, I think, was a big part of it. Yeah. So a lot of my life over the past decade or more has been researching herbs, but also researching those underlying causes of illness and that relationship that we have with microbes that we really shouldn't ignore that's much much deep, deeper than people realize right well and so you mentioned something in there that i want to make sure that people understand that like um being a physician yourself and it took you like multiple attempts to try and figure out what was going on yeah. You know, and so like if if, if somebody uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but if somebody comes to goes to their physician and says, I've got a problem because I don't feel right. And they say, oh, well, it's this. And it, that doesn't seem like the right connection for them for whatever reason. 
they don't feel at peace with that diagnosis or whatever. Like it's okay to continue searching, right? Oh yeah, no doubt about it. Like, and you know, but it's asking questions in different ways, right? right. So how we're trained uh, in the conventional medical system is to search for a diagnosis. Mm -hmm. So we gather the patient's symptoms. We do physical exam. We do labs. We do other diagnostic uh, uh, procedures to define the person's diagnosis. And, right. and that's important to define the diagnosis because that defines the treatment protocol. Right. Um, it works really well with acute illnesses. You know, you break your leg, you have a heart attack. It's great. But when you look at chronic illnesses, it breaks down because we're not treating the causes of the underlying illness. We are treating the pathways. We're treating the manifestations. So, right. so drugs for chronic illness are designed to block manifestations, to acutely block symptoms, to acutely block pathways of the of the the disease process such that we can slow the disease process but the bottom line is it very rarely results in wellness because it's missing something really really important drugs medical therapies do not directly promote healing because they don't address the underlying causes that are perpetuating the illness. And that's where that cellular model becomes really important. And that's because of the gut microbiome, right? And all the bacteria that are in there that are helping you. It's a piece of it. That are helping you grow. And so if you're not, because I know a lot of things like, um, you know, if you take an, if you take, if you take an overabundance of antibiotics, because you're trying to overcome whatever, whether it's an acute illness or a long-term chronic thing that you're, you may be killing the bad bacteria in your gut, but you're probably killing some good bacteria, correct? That's right. And so it's uh, like you got to balance that. Not, with not like, probably you oh, are yeah, you're, good bacteria you're, in your gut. Right. Right. So yeah, it's, um, w when we look at that cellular model, you know, it, it's different because that's not how we think in conventional medicine. So right. in my mind, the concept of diagnosis as we use it is marginally valuable mm -hmm. for chronic illness. Um, because what I'm interested in and the questions that I started asking for myself and for patients that I work with is why is this person ill? How did they become ill? Right. And so when you look at it at a cellular level, what wellness is, is when all the cells in your body are basically functioning normally and are healthy, right. right? So we are a complex collection of cells. The smallest functional unit in the body is a cell. Right. So whether it's your heart beating or brain impulses firing or thyroid being the thyroid hormone being produced, it's all done by cells. So everything that happens is a function of cells in the body. If you have a symptom of any kind, it's a reflection of cells being stressed or injured in the body. Right. And sometimes we can see that acutely, like if you block a coronary vessel and, and heart cells don't get oxygen, then they're pretty acutely distressed. Right. But chronic illness, we have cells throughout the body that are stressed. And if things aren't working, you start losing that function. And also those cells start sending a distress signal to the brain. So you start feeling discomfort. Right. So no matter what the symptom is, it's a reflection of cellular stress. Now, the cool thing is our cells have the ability to recover from being stressed. You know, right. you twist your ankle. If you walk on crutches um, and give that ankle a rest, it will heal. Well, what's happening is cells are recovering. They're repairing internal damage or regenerating new cells. So healing is cellular repair and right. regeneration. If so, you don't walk on crutches and keep walking on that ankle, right. it's not going to heal though. And that's what happens in chronic illness is our cells don't get a chance. The, the stresses are ongoing, so the symptoms remain. So 
with those chronic diseases and, and chronic issues that that sometimes we don't necessarily know are going on, right? We may not know that that stress is happening for months or years before we actually start to feel the manifestations or the symptoms of them. Um, but how do we, it, well, first off, they're like, it, you're talking about the cellular health. Do we, do we feed all the cells the same way? Like do the liver cells need the same nutrients and nutrition that, that the heart cells need and skin cells need and that kind of thing? Or do we need to no, look at I, things? Actually, it is highly variable. Your heart yeah. cells mainly run on fat. Um, your brain mainly runs on glucose. Uh, your intestinal cells mainly run on fats that are broken down by the bacteria in your gut. So different cells have need different nutrients. But if you're eating a well-rounded diet, um, you know, lots of vegetables, good healthy protein sources, other rounded uh, yeah, veg a rounded diet, mm -hmm. then you're going to nourish all the cells in your body. And that's the best way to deliver nutrients in your body. Right. So your cells are are pr pretty adapted to that. So, you know, it's 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 really how we're designed, right? Mm -hmm. So you look at most people today, they're eating a grain-based diet that's heavy in, in you know, processed grains and meats. Humans haven't been doing that. You know, yeah. for hundreds of thousands of years, we ate a forage food diet. It was about two-thirds plant matter and about a third wild animals. So it's nothing right. like what we have now. Now, if we ate the diet that we're eating now for another 100,000 years, our cells would work fine with that. But the abrupt changes we've made in the past hundred years, we're just not tolerating it well. Yeah. Well, and like in I that reminds me of something I saw the other day that that said, you know, yes, we we were hunter-gatherers, and everybody like tends to think about, oh, well, hunters first. But like oftentimes, like and, and if you think about like back in the days, you know, several hundred years ago. How accurate were they with the tools that they had to be able to hunt? And so it's like we were hunters, but you might not get meat, but like once a week, right? Because of your accuracy and the the availability to find the food to eat and or to the animals to kill or whatever. And so yeah. the rest of the time, you were either not eating or you were eating plants and you know fruits and vegetables and foraging for those things. And yeah, I think that was missed that piece of it. Right, that was one of the interesting things in my journey. Blue, just looking. There's so much great research out there. So looking at that question in different ways. So they were looking at it from a genetic point of view. They've looked at, um, you know, residues of food material where people live. They've mm -hmm. looked at it in uh, fossilized samples of stool. Um, but one of, one of the more interesting things that kind of tells the tale is our teeth. So. Yeah. If you look at a wolf, it's got you know, a wolf basically just has teeth for shearing meat, mm -hmm. uh, for cutting through meat. If you look at a cow, it's got molars right. for grinding plant material. Well, we're about two thirds molars and one third shredding teeth yeah. up front. Um, so that could, that is a suggestion that that two thirds, one third, and it probably very a little bit in different places, but, um, yeah, that's, that's, I, I, I think that's probably pretty accurate for most places on earth. Right. Um, and like, so to go back to, to back to the chronic diseases, just, just a little bit, as far as like, um, take, you know, Parkinson's for instance, like um, a lot of people, I think, don't think of Parkinson's necessarily as a chronic disease. Um, they think of it as something that just, you know, like you 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 get it when you get old. But I know that it, it's something that uh, develops over I, time, I, right? I, it's I like, would say Michael J. Fox would disagree with right, that. Right. It's something yeah, that develops no, you can get a long it time. Yeah. Um, and but it's 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 one of those diseases that, that like once it develops past a point, there's like a, a no turn back as far as right now, like there's not a cure. There's not a, like we can just revert back, but if we're right. developing those symptoms along the way, can we, it's, is there a, like before that no turn back point, is there a spot where we can say, if we change our diet, if we change what we're doing, can we reverse those cells back and help the gut? Like to a certain extent, so manage those symptoms. So you don't necessarily see them as much. 
Yeah. So, so you want to go deep with Parkinson's here just a minute? Just to sure. Okay. Um, looking at what causes cellular stress or cellular injury, mm-hmm. you know, there are really five categories of things. It's what we eat. You know, if we're eating a bad diet, that can stress our cells. Uh, toxic substances that we're exposed to in the environment. And, you know, our environment is really saturated with oh, yeah. chemicals from petroleum and plastics. And we're getting a lot of that. And that hinders cellular functions. Um, we're not sleeping like we should. We're chronically stressed. We're running schedules. We're not exercising like we should. We need exercise to move blood and normalize hormones. But the fifth factor is the microbes. And that's the one that Lyme disease really keyed me in on. And at first, when I was studying Lyme disease, it was like, okay, there's this microbe that's causing this illness. Mm -hmm. And when you see that in acute illnesses, it's really common, but you don't really see acute Lyme disease that often. Most people Mm -hmm. don't get sick acutely from the bite. Most people identifying with Lyme disease have chronic symptoms. So, you know, people don't die of acute Lyme disease like right. they would Ebola or things like that. So right. it's so then I started finding that as we were moving through time, we were finding that people had what we were calling co-infections. They were fine to have Bartonella and other things that were spread by ticks. And then we find, well, ticks actually carry hundreds of bacteria, oh, yeah. every tick. Yes. But then they were showing up with things that maybe didn't come from the tick that could have come from other places. And that carried me farther, just looking at all these microbe connections. So where I am today is it's much more dynamic than you can possibly imagine. Yeah. So you sent me a study connecting Parkinson's with a disrupted gut microbiome, but they didn't take the step of, of asking could it be actually the microbes that were invading the brain from the gut? And the answer is yes. And so when you look at all the pieces, um, you know, this past weekend, I I cataloged six different studies showing that we actually have dormant microbes in our bloodstream inside of our red blood cells. So yes, we have this. So in our gut, our first layer of defense is our normal flora. Mm -hmm. So the normal flora suppress some of those pathogens. And if you disrupt that with bad food and antibiotics and stress, you know, that and that causes what we call dysbiosis that can cause gut dysfunction. That can lead to leaky gut that we know proteins cross across. Well, guess what? The bacteria cross across. So we've, you know, there's a study from 2015 demonstrating that bacteria are actually constantly trickling across from the gut into the bloodstream. Okay. And when you get dysbiosis, that trickle becomes a flood. Right. But many of these bacteria invade red blood cells and become dormant. So, and then you've got to microbes that cross from the gums and the skin and the sinuses And they get into our bloodstream and they end up in our tissues in very low concentrations inside cells. So it's not just tick-borne microbes or a couple couple of other things. It's everything that you've been exposed to during your lifetime and things that have crossed from your gut and your sinuses and your gum become embedded in your tissues. Right. And researchers are calling it the dormant blood and tissue microbiome. So oh, it's wow. like we have a whole microbiome of the brain. So there were right. studies done on multiple sclerosis and Parkinson and, and Alzheimer's that they were able to find hundreds of species of bacteria that were actually living in the brain. But the really interesting thing is in these studies, they did control specimens. They were looking at brains of people who died of something other than a neurodegenerative disease, hundreds of bacteria there too. So we actually have bacteria in all of our tissues, it appears, and they are inside of our cells. If our cells are healthy, these things can stay dormant Mm -hmm. for years, for a lifetime. But we eat bad food, 
expose ourselves to toxic substances, don't sleep, don't don't do the things that we need to do to stay healthy, to keep ourselves healthy, these microbes can reactivate. And the microbes can shift from a a internal environment that favors cellular health to one that favors microbe growth. And they start breaking down cells, which is food for other microbes. Right. So they've actually started documenting this, and it's really fascinating. So when you look at something like Parkinson's, the microbes are already there. Mm -hmm. But when you stress those cells, and the thing is, different microbes have different potential to invade different cells. Right. So along with Parkinson's, you do see other changes in the brain and Lewy body formation and signs of cellular stress. So it's not just the, the cells. So there's an area of the brain called the substantia nigra. Right. That and what happens in Parkinson's is if it, you know, if you don't start addressing these in an early stage, you actually it obliterates the cells because here's what's happening. And this is and this is an auto, this is is what we refer to to autoimmunity that's pretty mm -hmm. much associated with any of these cells. If you can imagine that you have bacteria, viruses in low concentration in, in tissues throughout your body. Mm -hmm. And here you have to understand that a bacteria is a thousand times smaller than one of your cells. So right. you can have bacteria inside your cells that are dormant and your cells keep right on functioning. Right. But if they reactivate and start destroying those cells and start emerging to invade other cells, the body reacts to that by making antibodies to the cell's that are being invaded. Right. And so if this is going on in, in, in all of a certain tissue, that tissue gets, gets destroyed by our body. And that's what autoimmunity is. So that's ultimately what happens with Parkinson's is you destroy the cells in the substantia nigra that produce dopamine. So dopamine is important for initiating movement. So right. people lose that. They don't have it anymore. Um, but interesting, there's there's some cases. I read about one um, about a guy in South Africa that developed Parkinson's when he was in his 30s. So, you know, he it was severe Parkinson's. Mm -hmm. He wiped out all the cells in his substantia nigra to initiate movement. But he started doing self therapy that he retaught himself how to walk. Now he, okay. you know, instead of those natural um, um, involuntary movements that were required for walking, he had to consciously learn how to put one foot in front of the other, right. and he retaught his other areas of his brain to compensate. And he lived until his late seventies and he functioned at a very high level all of that time. Wow. So it just shows that how resilient the body is. Mm -hmm. And if you're doing the things that you need to do to, to, to enhance cellular wellness, it can do some remarkable things. You know, we spent so much time trying to fix the body and the message is, no, you create an environment that allows the body to fix itself, right. and it will every time. Right. So it it sounds a lot like what I've heard about from an epigenetic standpoint. Like if you 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 have the genes for something, but you you have the control sometimes to turn them on or turn them off, and then you get you know whatever it is developed in your in your body, right? And so like based on how That's you right. eat in the environment and that kind of thing. So it sounds very similar with the microbes that if you if you if you give them what they want they're going to you know take charge of the jail if you will like that's right and run them up yeah. and and at a certain point there's going to be a no no coming back yeah i you know i i think the microbes that we pick up through time probably have a are a greater differentiator of what illnesses we might end up with than our genes Mm -hmm. But you throw it all together and you throw the type of stress factors that we have together. You know, some of it is luck of the draw. Um, right. I've picked up microbes that are different from you right. that may have a high that that may give me a higher uh, potential for for risk of certain illnesses. But 
I'm healthy and I overcame a pretty significant illness. Mm -hmm. So it means that I can control those microbes. Have I eradicated them from my body? No, I don't think so. Right. But they're dormant again and my cells are healthy. And, you know, so that's the message. It's, it's not. So when you look at acute infections, like, um, any kind of like a, acute COVID or, or mm -hmm. acute pneumonia. Um, that's very different than this chronic um, situation that we talk about. So this, this relationship that we have with microbes with chronic illnesses is, is very different. Yeah. Um, so, but I'm finding connections um, of various kinds of microbes to Alzheimer's, to cardiovascular illness, to Parkinson's, to everything. And we're just, you know, we're in the early stages of piecing this all together, but the information that the science is out there is just fascinating. Yeah. So it's the, cause you mentioned obviously the autoimmune disease and that's, that's one of the things that, that it sounds like the, the microbes are, are definitely um, helping along. Right. They're, they're I don't think you can along. explain the autoimmune, autoimmunity without, without the microbe component. I just don't think you can explain. And so it. is, but it, so is it something where, because most people know immunity is something you build up a tolerance to, uh, you know, a certain bacteria or whatever. And so you become immune to it. And, you know, that's why you get the different vaccines that are, you know, it's to help you become, you know, tolerant of it. So it doesn't have these huge symptoms and signs and manifestations in you. Is that so are we do we build up a tolerance to the microbes? But it doesn't sound like that's the case. It sounds like they're always there. It's a matter of helping them right. form dormant and not wild. When you look at acute illness, it's the high-grade threats like Ebola or AIDS or those kinds of things that are the greatest threat. And and, and here's the deal. I, I don't I don't think a lot of people understand the difference between an acute and what an acute infection is and right. what these chronic manifestations are. So what an acute infection with any microbe is, is the microbe breaking through the barriers of your body. So, so, you know, our, one of our first levels of defense is we have barriers, you know, we right. have skin, we have the lining of the gut that keeps those microbes contained. You know, we have linings of the lung and, and, and so that barrier is an important thing that keeps a lot of stuff out. But so microbes are constantly trying to find ways across that barrier. And right. we tend to think of a microbe in the way that it enters the body. So, you know, we think of respiratory infections like COVID because that microbe specializes in entering the body at the lungs. You know, that's right. the barrier it's trying to cross. Um, Tick-borne microbes, they're trying to cross that skin barrier and they're using the insect as a vector to do it. Um, so, you know, microbes are constantly trying to find ways to get past those barriers. Our immune system is kind of the second layer of defense because things do get across the barriers. Right. So, you know, that's that's the immune system protecting us. Um, and so 70% of the immune system is surrounding the gut because mm -hmm. bacteria constantly cr trickling across. So those high-grade pathogens cause a big reaction with the immune system. But the deal is, you know, what they all want is to get to the bloodstream because the bloodstream is the highway to everywhere in the body. So the immune system is trying to, to, to knock down those numbers and get rid of them. And the deal is no matter what kind of infection that you have, some microbes make it through and right. get to your tissues and get to your cells. I mean, it was really fascinating that, um, you know, you look at people that survive Ebola, about 60% of people survive Ebola. Um, and looking at those people after they have, you know, well gotten over the infection, they were test and they were able to find Ebola virus still in their tissues. Oh, wow. Um, so the immune system was controlling, you know, that, that major infection, right. but it was still there. You know, yeah. it hadn't eradicated it. And the deal is... A big part of our defenses 
is our cells. Mm -hmm. So our cells actually have defenses against microbes. So we're using a process called autophagy. Uh, cells can expel or destroy a microbe when a microbe invades a cell. So for those microbes that make it through, they get through the barriers, they get through the immune system, they make it to tissues, one of three things can happen. You know, either the cell is healthy and it is able to ward off that invasion. The microbe gets the upper hand because it overwhelms the cell or it's an unhealthy cell. So the more unhealthy you are, the more susceptible you are. Or this other defense thing that a lot of microbes use is they become dormant. Right. And, you know, this is going on all of our lifetimes and they can stay dormant forever. And so it just the connections to various chronic kind of chronic illness is it's pretty crazy. Yeah. But the deal is there are no medical therapies that treat this. And that's why you're not hearing about it. Right. So is that why, like, because they can be dormant for years, they're still there. You, you, you haven't eradicated them. But is that why, like, some people just all of a sudden, like, boom, I just got this, like, out of nowhere, this disease or this, you know, like, it just hit me. And all of a sudden you go to the doctor and they're like, oh, my gosh, you're so sick. And they're like, I, I was fine a month ago. What I found is when I go through that counseling, typically what I find is everybody has factors that they're not recognizing. Right. And a lot of times, you know, you have to build up to a threshold before you start seeing symptoms, you know, enough cells in the body have to be affected. But typically, you know, when I go through those parameters of diet and an environment and stress level and and exercise level and sometimes you know like a, uh, a, a a new infection with a new microbe can mm -hmm. precipitate that chronic um, illness um, so those five factors i typically put together put together the story i mean it's like doing right. detective work and um sometimes it starts at the person's birth but um you go back through everything and you go okay yeah that's here that's why right. you became ill but it does a lot of times it's that tipping point you know you get to that tipping point and bam everything starts to starts falling apart and if you're only treating the symptoms from a pharma pharmaceutical standpoint, like you're, you're, you're never right. going to get to like what's actually causing this. And so there's, that's why there's like, I always seem to get sick every couple of months or whatever, because the pharmaceuticals wear off and yeah, everything comes back because you never really treated the problem. Right. Right. Yeah. So, you know, that's, that's where the herbs, um, you know, that's, why the herbs were so important. You know, I thought I was taking them just to kill microbes. And when you look at herbs, all plants have antimicrobial properties, mm -hmm. but unlike taking a multivitamin or something like that, when we take an herb, what we're getting is this complex chemistry of the plant that the plant is using for defense and regulatory purposes. Mm -hmm. So it's like hundreds or even thousands of chemicals that plants are using to protect their cells against free radicals and toxic substances and radiation, all the things that threaten our cells, but yes, every grade of microbe. So it's not like one chemical that you would have with an antibiotic. It's right. a whole system. It's like embracing the plant's immune system. Right. And there's a certain amount of intelligence or sophistication around it. It was really interesting that something that I came to observe in my own recovery and that, and that of others too, but I actually found a scientific study that, that proved it, is that herbs suppress pathogens in the gut and in the body but don't disrupt normal flora. And that would make sense, you know, right. because the plant is having to deal with that same situation. It doesn't want to, to kill off the normal flora, the favorable bacteria. So herbs typically don't. And that's why I could take them for years on upon years. And they actually made my gut better instead of worse. So, so it's this robust cellular protection that we're right. getting 
against all of these stress factors. So in that way, by reducing cellular stress, the herbs are doing something that drugs can't do. Herbs are promoting wellness at the cellular level. They're promoting healing and promoting cellular recovery. And that is remarkable. Yeah. Well, and that's, you know, that's, that's the big key to health is, are your cells healthy? Like you've talked about, like if your cells healthy, it can, it. it can withstand onslaughts from all kinds of different things. And, and I've said this before in, in other podcasts and people I've talked to is that like, if you're, if your cells are, you're always going to have some cells that don't form correctly, or they're going to be, you know, not, not a hundred percent. Um, and those can cause, those can become cancer cells, but if your other cells around them are healthy, then they're not going to spread and it's just going to die off and, you know, you're going to be fine. Um, but it sounds like it's the same type of thing is like, if you're, if your cells are healthy, it doesn't matter what microbes are coming in, you know, your cells are just going to, going to fight them off and you're just going to get really important. Life. Yeah. It's um, making that microbe cancer connection. Um, I've found studies that they've actually found intracellular microbes of various kinds bacteria that are living inside tumor cells. Um, basically, oh, wow. tumors have a microbiome. And interestingly, oh, wow. here, here's an interesting way to think about this, all right? So our cells have restricted growth. Mm -hmm. And what that means is you can only have so many heart cells and you can only have so many liver cells. It has to be controlled so that if, if a cell goes missing, you put one in replacement, you don't right. just keep growing cells. If our cells take on unrestricted growth, that's what cancer is, right? Well, if you put bacteria in a Petri dish full of food, they keep growing nonstop. Mm -hmm. Their growth is unrestricted. And I was actually able to find a study where they were able to take stressed cells from a multicellular organism and introduce intracellular bacteria, and it formed cancer every time they did that. And they wow. found that the bacteria was actually inserting its gene for unrestricted growth into that cell, causing it to grow like cancer. Wow. And that is, uh, yeah, it really, yeah, this micro connection, I think, is much stronger than people realize. But when you look at the herbs, you know, not only do they have the antimicrobial properties and all these protective properties, it's been well documented that they have all of these things translate into anti-cancer anti properties. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so taking herbs every day, that's a big message that I have. You know, so many people are looking at taking herbs to solve a problem. You know, I've got this symptom. I, you know, I'm not sleeping or I'm stressed right. or whatever. I'm going to take an herb to get rid of that like a drug. And they found, well, it's not as strong as a drug. You know, herbs do have some of those capabilities, but their main value is taking them every day for these protective benefits. Right. And, and that's, you know, if everybody was, you know, changing their diet, doing their lifestyle, but also taking a basic assortment of herbs every day, we wouldn't have nearly the rate of chronic illness that we have in our world today. Yeah. Well, and one of the things that I think steers people off or, 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 they they decide oh it's not for me is you, you mentioned early on when you were talking about yourself is it it took you five years to really get past yep. everything you know it's and like you said they're not as is as potent necessarily up front as some of the pharmaceuticals out there and so like it it's a long term commitment to making that that change internally yeah it's there there is no quick fix like oh, okay take this and everything's going to go away. Well, I think, you know, that's a big role of what I'm trying to do. And and I appreciate the opportunity to do that today is to change ex people's expectations of herbs. Mm -hmm. It took me a long time to change my expectations, but I think their true value is taking them every day as a preventative. Um, that herbs have more value than that than anything else. And we're we're not really looking at them that way, but I think it's time that we start. But when you look at, you know, changing your health habits, behavior modification is hard. Learning oh, yeah. a new diet, learning how to reduce stress or clean up your environment, all those things are hard. 
taking a handful of herbal capsules is just the easiest part of the whole thing. <laughs> right. You know, it's it's just so simple. Yeah. And, you know, we've trained 50% of our population to take a, you know, more than half of people take a multivitamin every day. Right. And there's study after study showing it doesn't do much right? Um, because it's just providing nutrients that if you're eating a healthy diet, well, maybe you're okay without that. But the, the chemistry of the herbs we're not getting in our diet. So say you're going out of your way to eat a really healthy diet that's rich in vegetables. And, and you know, and, and your question is, is that enough? And I would make a case that no, it's not. Because we have trained all of our food plants to produce calories. We've right. cultivated food plants to give to do calories on top of everything else. And that years and years of cultivation for higher and higher yield of calories has come at the loss of the protective phytochemicals. So right. even our, you know, and not to say that you shouldn't, you know, eat broccoli and celery and all of these things because they do have some really wonderful protective chemicals in them, but not to the degree of any herb. Right. And it's because wild plants still have to maintain those defenses and they're not producing. So herbs are wild plants that aren't, you know, in preference for calories, they still have robust protection of these phytochemical defense systems. Right. And our, our, our food plants just don't have that. Um, so when you look back at that forage food diet, they were getting tons of that. Oh, We're yeah. not anymore. Yeah. So taking herbs is is the shortcut to get there and yeah. and replace that thing that's really missing in your diet that you could regain so much benefit from. Yeah. No, and that's one of the things that like I I I I'm a sucker for watching some of the National Geographic shows about, you know, um people that go off and try and join the tribes and see if they can live in their situation for a day or two days or five days or whatever. And it's always fascinating that, you know, they'll be walking through this trail or whatever. And the, the, the person that lives in that tribe is just grabbing a handful off of a branch and like, okay, I'm going to eat this, this herb or this, you know, this plant in like the, the host of the show that's there experimenting with his own life and seeing if he can live it is like, really, that's, that's like, okay, let's try it, you know? Um, and it, but it, like you said, they're getting so much from just the, the wild, plant that that we need and we're missing when we only shop at the grocery store buying the same things every week from week to week and especially we're missing it if we're eating fast food sure yeah yeah i think that's true i mean that's i've explored that myself and uh and interestingly the you know there there are new apps that you can get on your phone to identify plants so i've mm -hmm. been doing that for several years and what i found is most of the plants around us aren't poisonous. There are only a few right. poisonous plants here and there. And of course, if you go out eating stuff, you really need to know what you're doing. Sure. sure. Um, and I'm I'm pretty careful about that. But there are a lot of medicinals that grow around you wherever you might be that have wonderful protective properties that are okay to eat. Now, what foraging doesn't provide though is calories. I right. mean, if you're going to right. shift right. to a forage diet, you're going to be working all day long just right. to get enough to survive. So it's kind of like we're in the best of both worlds. You know, we've got this great food system that we can get wonderful food any time of the year. We don't have to forage all day. We can right. supplement and, and, and enhance that with herbal supplements. And yeah, we're, we're really in a wonderful situation that so many people just aren't taking advantage of. It's great. Right. Yep. Well, and, that, and that's the thing. I think it's, it's, it's mixing and matching all of that together and learning how to do that. And, you know, and so like that could bring us to, I think, a, a, a great point, give you an opportunity to talk about your book and what you're doing and how people can get in touch with you and connect with you and find out more. 
Oh, sure. Absolutely. Well, the new book is The Cellular Wellness Solution for all the reasons that we have been talking about. Um, it's really like four books in one. You know, it's like 500 pages. Um, so the first book is just that cellular theory. And, mm -hmm. you know, it took me several years to research and make sure that there was science to back up everything that I was saying. And then another year just to put it in, in a fashion that people could consume comfortably right and and the feedback I'm getting is that it's it's easy to read it's easy to consume so that's kind of book one um, yeah. book two is everything you really need to know to embrace herbal therapy not a technical herb book but just the stuff that you need to know to start with a basic selection of herbs to protect your health and enhance wellness for the rest of your life and how to navigate that and and you know and move on uh, to enjoying other herbs. Right. And then book three is just um, guidelines for lifestyle, for diet, environment, you know, stress management, all of those things. And then the last part is applying those principles to specific areas like cardiovascular health or right. prostate health or menopause or brain those kinds of things just to, uh, you know, so, so different people will use the book different ways, right. but I think most anyone would find it to be a really good resource. So that's the book. Um, I am medical director at a company called vital plan that we do programs and, you know, selections of herbs just to make that whole process easy of, you know, things that work well together right. from a Western science point of view. So what are the chemicals doing in your body and but also the high level of quality as far as you know purity and potency and not right. having contaminants we go through all the different testing and, and all of that so that's at vitalplan.com and you can find the book there you can find the book on amazon um and uh yeah that's what we do and it, it's a lot of fun so where are you most active as far as social media if somebody wants um, to follow stuff. Trying to be a little bit of everywhere. Okay. Um, you know, I didn't get it started with social media like a lot of people. Um, and so, uh, you know, Instagram, um, probably, you know, I tend to be more long winded. <laughs> so YouTube <laughs> yeah. is good for me. But okay. I'm trying, you know, I'm working with my team to try to get it down to little nuggets that we right. can put on Instagram and TikTok. Um, assuming TikTok will be here, who knows? Right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, we, we try to get the word out there no matter what. So this year, this is going to be my social media year. I'm working on a campaign to just give those nuggets of advice like every day through different right. channels to bring people along and maybe start a conversation uh, that we can all share in right. uh, about where we should be going as a culture and a society for wellness and why herbs should be such an important part of that. Right. Well, uh, you convinced me. I mean, it's I already knew they were important, but it's even more like the 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 properties that they provide us um you know it we just absolutely have to have um, yeah you know, truly it, um so i will link all those connection pieces to you um in the show notes so people can just click on a button and, and be able to find you um and learn more uh if they have questions so That's thank great. you so much dr rolls for being a for being a guest it's been great well, thank you for the opportunity it's been a lot of fun truly Thanks for checking out the All in Health and Wellness Confidence Through Health podcast. Our goal is to use health as a conduit to help you reach your goals in life.
black out, her grip is getting tighter on me. I think I like it deep inside, I feel the fire in me. She like the milky, steamy cream into the coffee in me. She got soul in a sway.